Well, good morning. Good morning. There we go. That's pretty good, actually. That's a good response. <clears throat> um, we're going to kick off today, uh, and actually it's going to be four weeks, roughly. I don't know how the Lord's going to squeeze it together, but he said just wait and see. So we're all going to wait and see together. Uh, but I was, I was kind of sitting with him the other night, and I don't know if you've ever memorized an entire chapter of the Bible when you were like 10 and then thought about it like all the time for like your whole next 10 years. Uh, but I have, and it's Psalm 23, and it's, it's a really funny chapter because, you know, you when, when you know six verses, because it's a short chapter, it's only six verses, and so when you know six verses by heart that you used to recite daily, and now at least probably once a week, I think of the chapter, you start to think, oh man, I, I got this one figured out, like I know what's in this one, and then God's like, oh really? And then all of a sudden, he starts showing you things that you're like, oh wow, this is this is actually pretty incredible, and I don't know how I didn't see this before. And so what, what we're going to be talking about is some of those things that God's been pointing out recently. And, and so this week, we're, we're going to talk about this idea of restoring my soul. I think so many of us uh, come to various seasons in life, and, and we don't recognize the seasons when God is saying, I don't have anything for you to do. Like, I don't, there's no task in this season. This season is purposed for restoring your soul. Would it be okay if God restored our souls a little bit today? Yes, yes, there we go. I, this is good news. I think all of us have times in our life and even on a daily basis, we need to be restored. You know, I, I heard the Bible put this way once that the Bible is like breathing in spiritually. And, and, and so often many of us go an entire week without uh, reading the Bible and we, we get our one breath on Sunday and it's like, man, we're just holding our breath all week long. And, and today I just want to speak a little bit to this idea that we can be in the Lord's presence in such a way that he is restoring our soul, even in just the little moments in the day, as well as those seasons in life where we're a little bit mad because we're like, God, why, why aren't I seeing movement? And he's like, oh, because your movement, as you call it, is actually going to take you through a valley and that valley is going to be much harder, much more difficult, and in some cases, much longer than you're ready for today. So we're not going to move. We're just going to stay for a little while. So with that said, I'm going to pray. We're going to, we're going to talk very briefly about why we're in the living room instead of the shop, and then sometimes we'll be in the shop and not the living room. We'll, we'll figure it out, though. It's, it's a week-by-week -week basis, uh, but let's pray. So God, right now, I just pray that you would restore our soul. In your mighty name, I pray. Amen. If, uh, if there's going to be a sub point, sub idea to restoring my soul, it would be this. It's, it's getting caught up in a moment. And all of us know what it's like to, to be in love and to be young and to get caught up shirking responsibilities and not coming to your uh, sister's uh, rehearsal for her wedding and, and all of those things because you're young and you, you get what? You get caught up in the moment. And I believe that the first part of Psalm 23, David is trying to communicate how he would get caught up in the moment with the Lord. Now, what's important is, is so often I, anyways, I'll speak about myself. I've, I've read this and gone, okay, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's a first verse. And, and we kind of think of it as when David was a shepherd, you know, and he's out in the field and that's how I've always pictured it. But, but I want to be clear about something is the next thing he says is you make me lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside still waters. You restore my soul. In other words, he had already done something draining that his soul needed restoration. And so this is not just a verse for when you're in training and when you're in the field. This is a verse for no matter what season you're in, you're going to come to a time when God's forcing you to lay down to restore your soul. There's an idea I had and I wrote it this way so that I don't butcher it. I'll just read it exactly as I put it down. I said, how often... Do we get mad at God for lack of movement when he's preparing us for a valley? Dreams are often on the other side of a valley, and God is saying, catch your breath before you go. So I want to I break down this, this first phrase from Psalm 23 really briefly, and it's, the Lord is my shepherd. 
Now, I, I can't remember if I've broken this down super in depth, but I'm going to do it as, as, as briefly um, and intricately as I can is that word the Lord is a promise. And it, the promise is this. What a Lord does is, is he helps to provide guidance, but more specifically, he provides protection and he provides a, a, a standard by which everyone is to live. And so uh, the Lord uh, gives this promise as the children of Israel uh, are in Egypt. He gives this promise to Moses and he says that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew me as El Shaddai, which is God Almighty, but you're going to know me as Adonai, which is the Lord. And you go, why is that special? Like, you're God, you're Lord, like, I get it. And the importance is, it's, it's a more intimate relationship. It's a more intimate experience. What he's saying is, I'm not just a God above. I'm not just a high being. Now, on your behalf, I'm going to start to intervene for you, for your good. And so when David says the Lord, there's two things we need to grasp immediately. Number one, it's a promise from the Lord that he is intimately involved. But the second side is when you make someone Lord, you, you, you lose the right to say no. And so, and so what he's saying is I've lost the right to say no to you but you are protecting me. The next part is the Lord is my shepherd, which uh, uh, shepherd is a terrible job. Nobody wants to be a shepherd. Uh, but what a shepherd does do is uh, they lead the sheep. And this is, this is more specific than just a Lord because a Lord, yes, he's kind of a ruler and stuff, but a shepherd is specifically commissioned to lead a certain uh, 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 flock, uh, an amount, a group of people. And so David saying, the Lord is my shepherd is, is a little bit more than just, okay, Lord, you lead me. He's saying, God, you provide for me. And wherever you lead me there, you're going to provide for me. I, I love this idea because he's combining two attributes of the Lord. He's saying, God, I believe that you're going to lead me and wherever that is, you're going to provide. And then he says this phrase, I shall not want. And forever I've thought of this as like, I have, like, I shall not want, as in I don't need anything, like I have everything that I need. It's like, yeah, that's pretty good. But, but we're talking about leading, right? And so him saying, I shall not want, let's think of it this way, I shall not want to walk without you because you lead me and you protect me. And so today, if, if we're going to understand what it takes to restore our soul, we have to understand who we have to be with to get the break and the reprieve. The next part is, he says, you know, you, you make me lie down in green pastures. And I love this because he says, make, not you let me, you know. Like for me, if I was in a green pasture with the Lord, I'd be like, I'd love to lay down. But that's not what it says. It says, you make me. It's such a funny idea. I, I catch myself doing this all the time. When you finally get a break in life, you just start getting antsy, you know, and you're like, man, I need to do something. I need to accomplish something. Even like a single day of not doing anything, I'm like, I need a task. And God's saying, no, you need to lay down. <laughs> it, it, it's such a funny idea that so often we, we view progress in our minds as, as movement. And what God is saying is, hey, hey, movement is part of it for sure, but sometimes progress is being restored, allowing yourself to lay down. And, and here's the hard part about laying down is we think, oh, well, well, you know, the, the Bible talks all about idle hands and it, you know, it, it talks about, you know, you need to be up before dawn and not letting the sun come up before you. And it's like, yeah, that's true. Like, that's good stuff. Don't be idle. Don't make a habit of, of being lazy, but there are times in life when God has called you to rest. That's why there's a Sabbath. There's, there's this thing called the year of Jubilee where uh, every debt was forgiven in all of Israel. Every slave was set free. And even before the year of Jubilee, which is a cool year, it's every 50th year, every seventh year, they weren't supposed to do any farming whatsoever. Every seventh year when God lays out the law, he says, don't work. Every seventh year, so an entire year, you're supposed to let the ground rest. This is why when the children of Israel uh, go into slavery to Babylon, they were there 70 years because they had skipped their rest year 70 times. 
And so God forcefully took them out of the land and let it rest since they won it. There's a resting portion of our faith and, and we go, oh, but, but, but if I rest, if I stop, if I don't take my day off, then, then the bills will catch up and, and the enemy will catch up and then, and then I won't be able to get all the things that I want. And God's like, what? Like, don't you see that I've been leading and protecting you in your work? Am I not capable of leading you and protecting you in your rest? Think about David. David is on the run from Saul when he writes this. And so he's writing and he goes, the Lord's making me lie down in green pastures. What does that mean? While I take a nap, the Lord is standing guard. While I am laying down, the Lord is above me going, it's okay. I'll stand watch. Because a valley is coming. But, but just for now, be restored. I want to I wanna think about the uh, science of getting caught up in the moment. Getting caught up in the moment is where you're no longer worried about what you have to get to next. So often, uh, I can, can, can have my eyes set on what's to come and, and what's next. And okay, me and Taylor have a house and we also need a new car. And, and I'll always live in those moments. And, and a romance is kindled when you're not worried about the next thing on your list. I thought about this in worship today. I was, I was on my knees and I went, man, there, there was a time when I had a kind of a scratch on my knee and it like really hurt. And I got on my knees because I was like, I'm supposed to, right? You know, you're supposed to get on your knees before the Lord. And, and it's like, why do we have these ideas in our mind about what it takes, what kind of sacrifices we have to give for the Lord? And then it kind of hit me. It was like, no, we don't, we, we don't do those things because the Lord says you need to get on your knees. We do those things because he's done so much for us that he's worthy no matter how much pain it is for us to say, hey, I love you, God. As a church, I, I, I kind of want to take our worship to the next level. And, and I've been just as guilty of this as anyone is, is allowing my mind to wander, allowing myself to be worried about you know, every single thing in the service and going, oh, well, I need to make sure recording's perfect and, you know, that the computer's set up and that the mic's on. And, and there's a hundred things going through my mind in worship. And it reminds me of a verse we'll touch on in, in just a minute in Luke 10. And it's with Mary and Martha. And, and Martha comes to Jesus and she says, Jesus, Mary's been sitting at your feet all this time while I've been working. Tell her to come help me. And he says, you're doing many things, but only one thing is necessary. And that's not going to be taken from her. And I think if we just realize that the one thing necessary for success is the presence of the Lord in your life, it's intimate relationship with him, then we would be a lot better at working and a lot better at resting. You know, we read these verses again and again. The Lord is my shepherd. I, I shall not want, you know, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He Leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul. I don't know about you, but I've never walked past a still water by myself just for the sake of walking past a still water. Almost every time that I feel like, man, I would love to just sit by some still water, I, I, I would want to do that with Taylor because it helps to build that relational intimacy. You, you don't sit there and stare at nothing and go, man, this is just the greatest thing ever. Unless you're doing it with someone. It's, it, it's still what you don't even get the sound of running water. He says you lead me beside still water. In this passage, I really believe that God is trying to communicate to us. If you want to be restored in your spirit, you need to be willing to get caught up in the moment with me. And, and, and there's no better way I know to put it than that is, is God so desires to bless you. And the best way he knows to do that is to get you in his presence. I read a verse in Deuteronomy and it was so good. He, he literally said um, that I, I, I want to bless you. And so for me to bless you, you need to live in this way. And so he gives them the entire law and he finishes it with this statement. Live this way so that I can bless you. 
And so often we view God's rules in the other light. We go, live this way so that you don't get smited by lightning. <laughs> live this way so that, you know, I'll, I'll be proud of you. Like, no. Like, yes, God's proud of you when you make God good decisions, but he's not just sitting around mad at you waiting for you to fail or taking rest from you because, oh, you're rocking in disobedience, so you don't get to rest. I heard, I heard someone say to me one time, they said, yeah, I had been sinning in this way, and I knew I shouldn't have been, and so that's why I crashed my car. What? Like, where's that Bible verse? There's no Bible verse for that. Like, sometimes you just crash your car. And, and your obedience or disobedience, God's not going to punish you to get you to go be, like, obedient. Now, there's consequences to actions, for sure. But it's not like God's just, like, throwing down lightning. And, and how often do we rush into a valley not having rested, and then we're trying to rest in the valley, and then we can't get any rest because we're in a freaking valley? <laughs> like, well, how, does, how does David describe the valley? It's the valley of the shadow of death. And, and we're going to talk about that, not a whole bunch this week, but I want to bring up one point is, is for one, it's, it's the valley of the shadow of death. In other words, I'm close enough to death that I'm right in its shadow. So you, you're not getting any rest in the shadow of death. And, and often we go to those places because something has to die. And so God's trying to say, hey, I need to get you a little bit of energy because I need to kill something in you. And we want to rush. The other thing that can happen in a green pasture season is, is we get to a green pasture and we're like, man, this is great. I'm feeling blessed. I got friends. I feel like I'm in my calling. And then God goes, this is great. You're rested. You're full. Let's go take on this valley. And we're kind of like, I'm in my green pasture. What do you mean we had to go do something? Like, I I'm in my calling. And God's like, no, we, your, your calling is not this pasture. And, and you've already been through so much that it would be unjust of me to let you die quietly without ever taking what you've had to go through and using it for good. Like, God doesn't want you to retire in a green pasture where you've never got to shove it in the enemy's face that you overcame a valley. And so, I, I, I really, really believe this. Your, your most effective state is at the end of a valley before your pasture. Because you've learned the lesson, and what does David put between I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and the valley, his anointing? So between your training and when you get finally to the end, you have this little itty bitty place where God is uh, uh, showing you uh, glory over your enemies, preparing you a table. He's saying, I don't care who's here, I'm gonna set up a table. I like to think of it, you know, we think he leaves the valley of the shadow to set up the table. I don't think that. Like, that's not what I see. What I see is he sets up the table in the middle of the valley once you let that thing that needs to die in you die. So he kills that thing that's been keeping you from getting anointed. And instead of getting you out of the valley, he sets up a table in the valley and says, everyone that's been against you is going to watch while you walk into your destiny. And, and we think that the pasture is all that he has for us. The green pasture is funny to me. It's, it's a funny idea because like we all love a green pasture season and we can mess it up both ways all the time. I do both where it's like, okay, I can't rest. And then it's like, when I get really good at rest, he's like, all right, time to take on this valley. And we're like, but I was just starting to rest. <laughs> like, Come on. But I think it's time that we start thanking him that the pasture is not the end. That everything you've gone through is worth more than finishing in a green pasture. That what he's going to do is he's going to take uh, the, the, the you that's on the other side of the valley and he's going to anoint you. And you're going to have victory over the enemy every day. And here's, here's why I believe that the table's in the valley. It's very simple. How else could you get revenge? You can't get revenge in the pasture. Your enemy's nowhere around. 
So you have to be where your enemy is. And where is your enemy? They're at the place where they attacked you. And so at the place where you're getting attacked is the same place where God wants to use you to be most effective against the enemy. And so he's going to set up a table in that place once we get this idea that something's got to die. And again, for something to die, you have to restore it a little bit. Hebrews 4, 6 through 11 says this, Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, talking about God's rest, and those who formerly received good news failed to enter it because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterward, and the words already quoted today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Verse 8, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of obedience. Let, let, let me paint this a little bit because there, there, there's something that the Lord showed me. It's a very clear progression. If you obey, you get to enter rest. If you get to enter his rest, you'll get restored enough that you'll get uh, uh, an anointing and a calling which you can start walking out. But it starts with the obedience part. And so often we will delay God setting up the table in the valley because we're not letting him kill this one thing in us. And so we're in the valley and we're like, this is unjust. I'm in a valley. Why am I in a valley? I shouldn't be in a valley. I was in that green pasture. I was doing great things for God. I was walking in what he told me to. It was awesome in that green pasture. I don't deserve this valley. And God's sitting there going, okay, well, for one, yes, you do. And if it weren't for my son, this is where you would be always. But we wouldn't stop at the shadow. Like you would just all the way die. And so never say that phrase to God. God, I don't deserve this. Like, okay, but, but listen, yes, you do. Without Jesus, yes, you do. Because the wages of sin is what? Death. Okay, so like... Where's the complaint anymore? There's no more complaining. So once we find ourselves in the valley, it's very simple. Just do your best to be obedient. And then the rest is going to come. He promises it. God rested to show us that rest is a good thing. I wrote it down this way. I said, if you rest, you will get to your destiny faster. In our haste, to get to the next, we often delay its coming. We cannot rush the green pasture or the valley. Like, we just got to take it as the Lord brings it. Would it be okay today if, if we didn't have to always think about the next step? If, if we're in a green pasture, we could be there. And if, if we're in a valley, we could just stay close to Jesus. I'm going to talk uh, more about the valley in the weeks to come and the rod and the staff and all that, and it'll be great. But I don't want you to count the minutes that you're with the Lord. I was thinking about this the other day. I was driving to lunch, and I went to get out, and Taylor's family was in town, and so it was like, well, I need to be there. And it's like, man, that's... God just wants someone who's like, I don't care who's in town. I'm just me and him. We have these things in our minds of like, oh, well, 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 God would appreciate me pouring into these people. It's like, yeah, sure, he would. But you know what God really wants? He wants someone to come into relationship with him. And he'll work out the details of the rest of your life that gets neglected because it's not actually neglected. Like it's better since you're with Jesus. You'll be better in those areas. He's like, I'll... I'll take care of what you miss. Like, just, let's just hang out. Luke 10, 41 through 42. Martha, Martha, 
The Lord answered, You're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what's better, and it's not going to be taken from her. I feel like some of us sometimes despise people who are uh, a little bit better at enjoying life, is maybe the right way to put it. Another way to think about it is more happy-go-lucky people who are just kind of go with the flow. We get mad at them. We're like, hey, I have to be disciplined. I have to do all this stuff to get in the presence of Jesus. Why don't you have to do all this stuff? And you know what Jesus is saying? You don't have to do all that stuff. You don't have to do all that stuff. One thing is needed. And the, the promise is he's not going to take that from you because you didn't get everything in line first. You know, Luke 10 is the founding uh, 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 chapter of the church. You have Jesus sending out uh, the, the 72, and then he gives them authority over Satan, and he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He's then questioned and tells the story of the Good Samaritan and then finishes with this story between Martha and Mary. And I love it because the entire idea behind the church is we love people where we are with what we have when we're there. And then he finishes the chapter by saying, love me the same way. Love me, love God, where you are, with what you have, when you're there. I want to finish with this thought, and it's this. It's, I really believe that God is saying, I'm preparing a table. And whether you're in a valley or a green pasture, he's saying, I'm preparing a table. And so you need to ask yourself, what, what is stopping me from sitting down? You know, for, for many of us, I, I really believe that we're, we're in too much of a rush to get to the next thing. And we just need to rest. And for some of us, we keep looking back at that green pasture going, man, that pasture was the best. And God's like, no, I got, I got a table. And the promise of God's table, I love this so much. This is one of my favorite things in the word is the promise of the table is he uh, fills our cup to overflowing. We read it as you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. But there's actually a semicolon, which I don't know if you know this. It's a, it's, it, it signals a shift in a sentence. So the sentence isn't over, so you're still anointed, but I'm addressing something else. So you're anointed, and also I'm going to fill your cup up. Not necessarily with the oil. I always thought about it that way. He's, fill, he's anointing me with oil, and then it's coming off my head into the cup. Did anybody have that picture in their head? I had that picture in my head. I could be wrong, but that was a picture in my head. And then I, I was sitting with him. He's like, that's not what I said. That's not what I said. What I said was, I'll anoint you, and then I'll fill your cup up. And, there, and there's two things we can think about for this. Number one, I have everything you need to walk out your anointing. The second thing is, you never had to leave my presence. We've talked about this, that, that in Jewish culture, if you filled someone's cup to overflowing while they were at your house, it signified that they can stay as long as they want. Their welcome never expires. And so, when you're in the valley, God's going to anoint you at his table. And then once you're anointed, he's going to say, okay, good news. You never have to leave my table. I'm going to provide everything you need in the midst of this valley to overcome the enemy. And I'm not going anywhere. So many of us think we're like, man, God led me to that green pasture and I was in that green pasture. And then, and then he forgot about me and I'm in this valley. And God's like, no, I led you to this valley because I wanted to show you this table I've been preparing. And on our way to the table, something just needed to die in you. But I can't get you to sit down at that table until we kill this thing. Like, it's got to go. And, and we're like, God, you forgot about me. I'm in this valley and you're not here. And, 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 the, and, and the green pastures, I, I, was, I had everything, but now I'm in this valley. And, and God's like, no, just, I'm preparing a table. And at this table, it's going to be the best. 
all the people who you point at and you go, I don't deserve to have to deal with this. Those are the same people who are going to have to sit there politely with their mouths shut while you get glorified for your obedience because you stayed close to me in the valley and now I get to anoint you so that you can stand against every scheme of the enemy and in the very place where you were most hurt, now you get to be most effective for other people. I'm trying to communicate that the, the green pasture was not all I had because you went through this hard stuff. And I'm not harsh. I don't want you to just go through it and then life end. I want you, even though you went through it, to use it to help other people. I want you to use it to move forward. I want you to use it in your anointing. And we look at the valley and go, man, I just, I can't take another valley. And it's like, well, fair enough. Like, sometimes you're not ready for another valley. Because the last one was so dang dark and so dang bad. I got... I'm not doing another valley, God. Like, like, I don't care what you have. I'm not going through another valley. And he's trying to say, no, I'm, I'm going to make all of it worth it because I'm preparing a table. I'm going to stop there. I could keep going, but I'm going to stop. And Nicole, if you would cue the uh, beautiful song, we're going to, we're going to play that just in a second and we have homework this week, and, and, and the homework is this, is just get caught up in the moment. Like, be a little kid with your girlfriend when you walk her to the door or to the car, and you just sit there just a little too long, just sitting there looking at her, or him, whoever. Just sit there a little bit. Like, what's the deal? What, what are we in a rush to? I thought about this the other day when I was going to bed. I was... I was like, man, God, I didn't read the Bible yet today. And it was like 12. It was late. I go to bed at like 9. And I said, no, God, you're more important than this sleep. And I'm not doing this in the hope that you'll somehow supernaturally give me more rest. Like we think about God in those terms sometimes. Like, oh, well, because I've been obedient, he'll do a miracle. Like what if he was just important enough that we prioritized him above sleep? And we didn't need a miracle to do it. So I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to turn the music up, and we're just going to get in his presence. Because I don't want any of us to lose sight of the idea of today is just about getting with the Lord. So God, right now, we just come before you and say, we want to get lost in the moment with you. God, we want to be by still waters. God, we don't want to count the minutes.
Amen? Amen. Amen. So, homework. Get caught in the rain. Don't rush too much. When you go to get out of your car, spend an extra 30 seconds, minute, two minutes, 10 minutes, an hour. Who cares? He's God. We good? Good. We're going to finish up with the testimony time really quick. I forgot to do the uh, explanation for why we're in the living room. So we're in the living room uh, because obviously me and Taylor's house still isn't ready. Um, so we'll be back and forth between the shop a little bit, depending on the week. We'll see how it goes. Um, but we're going to go check on the house today and then give you an update after that to see how close we are to it. So that's what I got. So testimony time. What has the Lord been doing in our lives? And if nobody hops up immediately, I'm just going to start pointing people out because I know God's been doing cool stuff. Um, no, I've just been, um, things at the shop been kind of going up and down lately with the ice storm and employees and different things and making some changes and whatnot. But, um, I really felt like the Lord wanted me to spend more time working on particular things. And I was like, no, but then I won't be there here at home. Um, not at the office cause I get very distracted. Um, but, um, I was like, no, I need to be there so we can, you know, I can make up for this or that. And the Lord, um, we had the best week we've ever had last week, and I was worked a day and a half um, <laughs> at the office, and uh, I just really felt like the Lord was like, "I've got this. I don't need your help. I didn't. I don't need you to be there to do this. It's it's His, and He's taking care of it." So it was just it was awesome, pretty spectacular. That's awesome. Reminds me of the pineapple stories. Do you guys remember that? There's a missionary overseas, and he had a little farm or whatever, a little, I say farm. Farm's not right. It was a little vegetable garden. and What was it? Pineapples or something? Anyways, he, he had, I think it was pineapples that he had, and the people kept stealing his pineapples. And he got all mad about it. He's like, right, stop stealing my pineapples. And they kept stealing it. And so he goes, you know, I'm, I'm just going to give it to God. So he gives it to God. They quit stealing the pineapples. And they're like, we really need you to take this farm back, because we, we're not going to steal from God. Like, we want to steal from you. He's like, I'm not taking it back. I'm not taking it back. Anyways, that just reminded me of that. It's kind of funny. <laughs> I'm not taking it back. It's God's. <laughs> so, anybody else? Huh? Uh, just this. Would you come up here by chance? <laughs> That's all right. We just won't record this one. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, all of you know, like, it's been really hard for Dad. Like, physically, the pain that he's in has been hard. And we've been praying a lot because he feels like he can't get traction to get the business started. And we take a couple steps, and then we just feel stuck. And take a couple steps, and we feel stuck. And we're like, we know we heard the Lord. We know we heard him. He told us to do it. We took the step of faith, and now it feels like we are in quicksand going uphill in the rain. <laughs> like, it's just been so hard. And um, just yesterday when you guys blessed us and just even my birthday last week, just such a peaceful day all together. I just, Dad and me last night after you guys went to bed, we're just saying like it was the Lord to just say like, don't give up. Like I'm going to provide even if the money isn't coming in the way you think it should and you're at this stage of life, like I've got you, you heard me don't give up. And so we just prayed. So that's our testimony. Just, it's going to be okay. We're going to get to where we're going. It's just hard. <laughs> but uh, your message was really awesome. Anybody else for a close? Yes. Oh, nice. Hey, girl. So what can you get up. Thank you. Okay. Um, so... I think most of you know this, but I wanted to share it. Um, a couple, probably a month ago, we weren't able to have Maverick sleep through the night yet. It was getting really hard. I'm just waking up like six to ten times a night. And the Lord told me, stop feeding him at night and he's going to sleep through the night. He's going to stop waking up. And I was having trouble just still holding on, like enjoying that time with him. And so I kept putting it off. And then I finally, like there was a couple nights that I was like, okay, I'm really done. Like I have to sleep. 
And so I finally obeyed after, I don't know, a few weeks. And then now he's sleeping through the night every night. So Nice. Yeah, Go, man. Yeah. Get wear off. <laughs> Get wear off on the other people. <laughs> All right. Oh. Well, yesterday, Cooper and I we had a good conversation. Yesterday, Cooper made a profession of faith. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. Cooper. Yeah. It's really cool, Coop. You know what the Bible says about that? It says that the angels in heaven are way happier. It says they rejoice even more for somebody who confesses that they believe Jesus the first time than for, what is it, a hundred or a thousand? That's a whole bunch of people <laughs> that uh, turn their lives back to God. And so when you did that, what happened in heaven was everybody threw a party. So you threw a party. Good work. <laughs> it's awesome, Chris. Can we go for four? <laughs> All right. Well, Jesus, we love you. Thank you for this day, God. And we just pray for Cooper, God, as he, uh, Jesus, as he accepted you in his heart. And Jesus, I just pray that you would show yourself to him in an incredible way, that he wouldn't have to wait till a certain age or to hear uh, uh, enough of me talking or Cody talking or anybody talking, but God, that you would reveal yourself to him today. God, for every single one of us in this room, we pray for a deeper level, God. The, the, the amount that we know you today is not nearly enough, God. We want so much more. And so, God, I just ask that you would come and you would pour yourself into every life. And, God, that the Philadelphia Eagles would lose. In Jesus' name, amen.